Good afternoon, Mr. Clement. I have a few questions for you on the relational aspects of diabolical influence. I'd like to thank you for your time in answering these. I think this is an area where we can apply common sense, life experience. After all, diabolical affliction or possession, obsession, oppression, this is the language of relationship. And so all of us are familiar with relationship. There's some universal and consistent features between relationships, creature to creature. And after basically a diabolical relationship, a relationship with a demon is a creature to creature relationship. It's a relationship between creatures who have intellect and free will. <clears throat> the difference being is the human has a corporal existence and thereby provides an active agency for the demon. And that is something that the demon wants, desires, is this for its own ends. The angel, rightly disposed, and the, the human, rightly disposed, entering a relationship, desires the good for the other. The diabolical, or the twist on that, is that anytime you enter a relationship desiring the good for you, it is suspect. Out of Christian charity and out of perfection of relationship, we must desire the good for the other. True love desires the good of the other. And our relationship is ordered to that end. In the disordered relationship, it's usury, it's utilitarian, etc. Going along the same line, oftentimes we enter relationships with less than pure motive or pure intent. To the extent that motive is self-centered or departs from a desire to achieve the good, then we're open to what we call psychological compatibility. And so our psychological compatibility, rightly ordered, is that the creature with whom we associate is also desiring the good for us as well as us for them, and above all, the ultimate good, God. We, there's a desire for relationship with God. And any creature relationship is secondary to the desire for relationship with God. You see plainly, clearly, that a diabolical relationship is not ordered toward God. It's ordered toward self. So there's a movement. One of the first levels of psychological compatibility is ad, being ad hominem or ad populum versus ad orientum. We're focused on the creature, either us or the other creature, to the exclusion of God. We see this modernly, especially in people who lack a modicum of virtue and decorum, who their idea of marriage is, this is how I am going to be fulfilled. This other person completes me. This other person is an object. I'm in love with myself being married to this person rather than in love with the idea of pursuing vocation with this person and pursuing sacrifice, spousal union, etc. So I think that's the first pass is to look at how the relationship started, what was the point of agreement, what were the circumstances of the relationship. When you look at it from a romance standpoint, anyone will tell you that you should not pursue or trust your feelings and emotions if you are, quote, on the rebound or if you are emotionally compromised. Very good advice. The demon is an opportunist, and he's going to come at us when we're compromised and to begin a relationship based upon injury, based upon wound, based upon some type of vulnerability to which he can exploit to his own advantage. Once you see that, you really can't unsee it. And so that's what we talk about. That's relational dynamics between creatures that apply to diabolical affliction, that apply to the psychological compatibility that we talk about. So you've talked about this psychological compatibility and entering through a uh, violence or a wound. Does that have to be a fresh wound? So the freshness has to do with chronology. I think that if you look at our diagnostic chart, whereby it says that this will start with a wound or some type of perceived offense, often there is a withdrawal period. There is a period of recoil 
if you will, acute pain, and that can last indefinitely. And so the diagnostic chart and relational uh, dynamics follow a sequence, but not necessarily a chronology. And with that sequence, is it one of these things where it gets worse and worse, the more that we're willing to recall it and, and talk about it? Yes, to the extent that we're willing to restructure our identity in light of the relationship, then it starts to shape us. For instance, let's say in a romance, a young man begins to court a young woman, and the courtship will affect his behavior, his the way he sees things, the way he sees himself, the way he sees her. And so proximity and intimacy, this fuels intimacy, not just physical intimacy, but intellectual as well as spiritual intimacy. There is some sharing as long as there's proximity, as long as we're in the company of the other creature, either physically and or spiritually. And the more we engage in those areas in which we are compatible, we begin to deepen the relationship. We begin to draw closer, if you will. And so the psychological compatibility is both affirmed and deepened. Can you give me some indicators that compatibility is actually deepening? So what we see is if you follow the diagnostic chart in our Libra Cristo material, you'll see this progression. You'll see that in those features during oppression, there is a broadcasting, there's a telling of the story. And in that telling of the story, you draw to you people who are psychologically compatible. Then you begin to discard people who are not psychologically compatible. And you begin to reorder your relationships based upon this new identity, people who affirm your identity or they do not. We see this in the whole gender dysphoria communication. We're seeing it being forced upon us. If we do not accept their mental illness, then we are their adversary. We're their enemy. And so they discard us. And that's precisely what's happening in the movement from oppression to obsession. And then once they move over the line into obsession, there's habitual mortal sin. And so what does that look like in a romance? It looks like physical impropriety. It looks like intellectual impropriety, whereby one says derogatory things about the other's family, et cetera, in an effort to pull them away and isolate and make them choose. With regard to physical intimacy, oftentimes the young woman and sometimes the young man, but more often the young woman, is called to compromise her values in an effort to appease, affirm, or grow deeper in what she believes is deeper in a relationship with the young man. So it's that compromising of values. It is that engaging in habitual mortal sin or behavior that is not good, that's indicative of the diabolical relationship or the relationship that is not headed toward the good, that doesn't have the good as its primacy. Then as it progresses, there is a mutual disdain for those things which are holy, those things which are beneficial, those elements of the faith, particularly the sacraments. And then the third level of obsession is when the life is reordered, the appearance is reordered, and they've essentially recreated themselves. That's the negative aspect. The positive aspect is for those people who have reconfigured themselves in the light of Christ. They put on the new man. And the relationship progression is the same, whether it's headed toward the good mm -hmm. or the bad, the sequence is the same. So is our ability to distinguish what way we're headed then more diminished as we get deeper and deeper either direction? So in the negative sense, we become numbed, but there's always going to be these moments, these prick of conscience moments, because the demon will push to absurdity. And this is the difference between a suitor and a seductor. A suitor who desires the good would never push you beyond your sensibilities and is very aware of those sensibilities and does not assume anything. Each day, the suitor will give you the option of uh, renewing the relationship, continuing the relationship or not. And this is ultimately our Lord, is he assumes nothing, he imposes nothing until we make firm representation. But in this suitor period, he's very much a gentleman. The seductor, on the other hand, is going to push until he meets resistance. 
He's going to push, especially the boundaries of sensibilities, moral sensibilities, faith sensibilities. And this is what would lead to a prick of conscience where someone finally says, wait a minute, that's not good for me. That's beyond what is good for me or normal. And then at that moment, that realization, that is when the spiritual battle really begins. This is domestic violence is an excellent example of a relationship with a diabolical entity is as long as he's getting what he thinks he wants and what he's pushing, but he will always push for more. It will never be enough. And then once the victim or the person resists, now comes the conflict. Now the abuse starts and the abuse within a diabolical relationship, just like in a human relationship. The abuse will take psychological form as well as physical form. As the relationship between the diabolical and the human progresses, their ability to distinguish is also being compromised. But there is always a component that is present that will allow them to hear that prick or to at least be able to identify the prick of conscience? They may not identify it as such, but there will be a discomfort. There will be an unease. There will be an anxiety. So St. Ignatius in the fourth rule of discernment of spirits makes the observation that for a soul that is headed toward the good, the evil spirit will bite and afflict and tempt. For the soul that's headed from good to bad, the good spirit will afflict. And so that is that prick of conscience, our guardian angel, the coming to our senses, our sensibilities are saying, I'd agreed to do this, but I won't do that. Anyone who's ever been involved in a relationship with a person who is malicious understands this template, understands this sequence is there's a pushing. They're never satisfied. And there's a pushing for greater and greater compromising of the other's values. That's that movement that we're talking about. And so the other thing is that always there is free will. The will is always free enough to say no more. It's hard. It's extremely hard. And once the person is habituated in their will, especially to the habitual mortal sin, it's very difficult to break that. And so it can't be done without grace, without appealing to God. The woman in domestic violence, once the man begins to beat her physically, the average is it takes seven times for her to leave. It will take seven attempts. We often think, why didn't she just leave him? There's that relationship. There's that psychological compatibility. And it's much the same with diabolical affliction. In diabolical affliction, are there consolations that are actually also counterfeit? Yeah, there certainly are consolations. It, oftentimes what happens is that they have associates and they have like-minded spirits, like-motivated spirits. Oftentimes there is a solicitation of them to use a crowd mentality to try to convince the person that the abuser is in fact the victim. And you see this over and over again. And so it works on their clarity, there's false mysticism, there's all kinds of things which seek to keep the person there. We've yet to have a case of possession that before liberation didn't have at least one false mysticism element or event. And so it's very important to, once you see the person as an abuser, to recognize that it, this is not going to change. Because the demon is beyond conversion. There's no possibility for the demon to be converted. Mr. Clement, I'd like to thank you for your time today. I look forward to more of these questions and answers. If anybody would like to have some questions answered, they're welcome to send them to info at montecristo.net. That's info at M-O-N-T-E-C-H-R-I-S-T-O dot N-E-T.